Hello and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today my guest is Wayne Maloney. He is the co-author of The Wentworth Prospect and it's a really interesting book. It's novel, it's Yoda in narration and it opens your eyes to maybe a better way. So Wayne, welcome. Thanks, Marcus. I've been looking forward to this. It's, uh, it's been a while since we've spoken, and uh, yeah, looking forward to a chat. Today, we're going to explore a number of uh, areas. Obviously, we're going to uh, explore the book and what it's all about. Um, but we're also going to look at some of the blind spots. Um, why is it leadership is failing to create a culture that creates enough appeal for people to want to stay? We're seeing this great resignation. We're seeing... Uh, the great retirement. In uh, IT, we're seeing uh, Talent LMS uh, saying that 72% of technology staff will be looking for a new job and possibly even leaving the industry this year. So that's an indication that there is something very rotten at the top. Um, Why if it sales doesn't adapt? How can we stop the losses and waste? How can we use technology to enable effective sales and stop playing the game of the silver bullet. And um, how do we make sure that we understand that tech is a tool and the hard work has to go into the whole revenue operation? And why is it so important that we create alignment and eliminate friction? So, Wayne, first of all, would you mind giving us 60 seconds on your history, please? Yeah, look, I, I, I started out life as a mechanical engineer, and uh, thanks to the owner of the business that I was working with at the time having a bad day and he and I having a, a, a disagreement, he suggested it might be better if I found a career elsewhere. And um, I, I fell into sales. A good friend of mine's father was a sales manager of an organisation and he said to me, why don't you come along and, and have a go at this? And, and that was it. And I moved into it, still selling engineering products. So I had a background in engineering. Then go... Uh, one of those sliding door moments, I also ran a series of martial arts schools and one of my students was a sales and marketing manager for a startup IT company or a data comms company in those days. And he knew my background in business development and he offered me the gig and I jumped in and it was then that I realised that knowing the product and knowing the technology is not as important as knowing the business applications and the limitations of what you're selling. So <laughs> I, I was great. I went into that literally without knowing what a modem was back in those days. And I, you know, and people looked at me when I joined and uh, I still remember, and I won't use the exact terminology, but the managing director used the terminology, the fact that I was a hydraulics engineer. He said, we're, we're employing bloody plumbers. And um, I just became very successful. And I think I became successful because... I didn't know the technology, but I knew the limitations of the technology and I knew what it could do for a business, and that's how I approached it. And I've done that ever since, and I've been very, very focused on business outcomes, positive business outcomes for organisations, rather than trying to go in and sell a product or a specific technology. And um, I think that that's one of the areas that we need to focus on as, as sales managers, sales leaders, sales consultants, that we need to work on that and make sure that people are looking at a business outcome rather than just trying to sell a product or a service or implement a piece of technology. Okay, so let, let's start with uh, the Wentworth Prospect. Give us a quick overview of the story. Yeah, okay. We approached the, uh, John Smybert, a good friend of mine and a guy that I'd done some work with in developing a, uh, a sales process that John had been working on. And John had written the foreword to my last book. So I approached him about... Sell, uh, writing a book on strategic selling, complex selling, because that's really where my passion is. And John suggested that why don't we do something very different and we write it as a novel? And uh, I balked at the idea, but John was really dead set. That was the direction that he wanted to go. So after a couple of false starts, we realised that uh, we weren't really novelists. We might be good sales consultants, but... Uh, we weren't all sales coaches, but we weren't good novelists. So we tried a couple of, uh, of ghost writers and that didn't work. And I had a very good friend of mine who came out of uh, advertising copywriting. He was a director of one of, the, of a couple of the major uh, advertising agencies in Asia. 
And he gave, he was mentoring me through the process and he said, look, why don't you give it to me? And he went away and he wrote two chapters and he gave them to us literally overnight. And John and I looked at each other and said, he just gets it. So we brought Jeff Clulow in and Jeff became the novelist and John and I were, I guess for want of a better term, almost the technical advisors to, to Jeff. So what we did is we had a main protagonist, uh, a girl called Sue, and she was starting out in business and uh, she was selling cybersecurity software. And she went through and was working in closing a major deal with a merchant bank. And we talk about the trigger event that set her off in getting through to that. So we start right at the front end of it. Then we use the advanced process that John had developed and I'd helped him through with on walking her through that step. What we did at the start without giving too much away, her mentor is killed in the first chapter and he leaves her a manuscript which actually walks her through and he becomes almost the ghost, if you like, behind the scenes, giving her the guidance along the way through the manuscript. And she encounters, and one of the reasons we wrote it as a novel is if we don't know, we should all know that sales is not a linear process. You need to have a process that you follow with an organisation. But as you work that deal, things are happening in parallel. They're not happening in serial form. So you've also got the politics and the pitfalls and the various interactions of individuals and personalities. And if you just write a book like a textbook or a hand handbook, you can't bring that into it. And that's so important in understanding how to sell these days is very much about understanding the people that you meet along the way and how do you address those. So we introduced uh, archetypes that uh, she has to identify. We talk about the different archetypes and personalities and we talk about people mapping and how you build those relationships that you sideline those that are going to be very negative to you. And Sue does this all the way through and we also look at leadership, which is a huge issue, and we highlight right at the start great leadership through her mentor, her sales manager that, that passed on, and we then highlight through the person that replaces him the very bad leadership or sales management because, as you and I have spoken about before, it's, and you intimated in the introduction there, unless you've got a good culture within your sales organisation, you're not going to retain staff and people are going to move on. And you need to have a supportive culture and a culture of development, not just a culture that's out there to go and fill that pipeline and close the next deal. Oh, come on, Wayne, your head's in the clouds. It'll never work. <laughs> We're not running a bloody holiday camp. Yeah, they yeah. to work. I'm not suggesting that you don't have targets that you've got to go out and get, but how many sales how many sales managers out there Marcus are actually helping develop and coach their people to go out and win that business you, you've, um, got, you've got to fail to learn and you've got to learn to fail um, exactly but if we're, if the average tenure of a salesperson out there at the moment is about what 12 to 15 months it's reducing it was 15 months the last stats that I saw how many of those are actually going to go out there and win large complex deals which have got a time frame of 12 to 24 months? And it, it's not going to happen. Then, you know, we as sales management can step in and be the heroes and claim the glory. So, uh, that, you know, that, that, there's a selfish advantage to encouraging that kind of turnover, especially if yeah. people are getting too big for their boots. Do you really see that as a sustainable way of growing a business and, and growing? That's the mindset. How, I mean, how many times have you heard that shit from leadership? Yeah, absolutely. It's terrifying. That's that's yeah. the prevalent, that's the dominant belief system. But Marcus, I think to me, you know, you, you spoke about blind spots earlier and, and I, I'll call it the weakest link. I think the weakest link in the revenue stream of an organisation is sales management because we... We just don't develop. 100%. But the problem is it's not their fault. that they, they are responsible, but they are not culpable. And the problem is that leadership hired them into those roles with no runway. The majority of people, are about 50% of management, are accidental managers. They woke up one morning, tapped on the shoulder and told Wayne, you're the manager now, off you go. 
And th these were the people who were your peers a minute ago, or people like them. And now you go into your first sales management job with never having interviewed, never having run a sales meeting, no idea how to run forecasts, no idea how to deal with difficult people, no idea how to handle someone whose mother's in terminal stages and, and their performance is down, and you don't know anything about them. Marcus, I was prom promoted into my first sales management role many, many years ago. I would think I was 23, 24, Again, and I was that role because I was such a great salesperson. Mm -hmm. And I went from being the golden-haired boy of salespeople within the organisation to being an absolute shite sales manager. I, I had no idea. I thought Double people whammy. just... Sorry? A double whammy. Oh, absolutely. And I was really fortunate that the general manager who promoted me into that position saw that I was struggling. And rather than react in a negative way and try and push me, he actually stepped back and he coached me through what was need what was needed. And he became a mentor of mine. Even when I left that organisation, he still mentored me. And I was really fortunate because my career without him could have taken a very, very different direction, Marcus. But oh. you know, I had I had no idea moving into the sales management role what sales management was about, exactly as you listed those issues. So let's let, let let's try to paint a more positive picture here, because I tend to be a bit of a curmudgeon. How good could it get if we create an environment where middle management in sales is actually equipped, trained, enabled, empowered. And instead of having a command and control management style, they have an operational coaching management style where in the moment when someone needs help, they stop, they think, they ask a question that's insightful, and then they agree some outcomes that the other person is then takes away and is responsible for. Now, Imagine how good that could get. Oh, I don't have to imagine it. I, I, I had two roles. One as a managing director of a New York Stock Exchange value-added teleco in Hong Kong and another as a sales manager within Optus, who was our um, second carrier here in Australia. And in both of those organisations, the regional managing director was exactly that. That's how he worked with me. And he coached me in certain areas. He was Asian. Uh, he was a Malay Chinese. I thought I knew the Asian mentality very well from my experience in martial arts, but it was very different once you actually live there and you're, you're working with it. So he stepped back and he helped coach me through that as a managing director on the culture. So that was one experience. There was a guy that I worked for at um, Optus who just empowered his, his subordinates. And I learned so much from him. He just, uh, and I was a fair way into my career at that point, but he really built on my understanding of sales. And I've actually, you mentioned empowerment and control. I've actually got a note here that's just stuck to the bottom of my computer because I was only talking to someone about it today. And they were asking me about salespeople and clients. And I said, these days, both salespeople and clients want to be empowered. They don't want to be controlled. And that's you know, where good salespeople and good sales managers come in. They empower people to perform. And as you, you said earlier, people need to fail to learn and they learn when they fail. And in those sort of situations, the sales manager that's coaching can step in and guide them through and take them on those next steps. He doesn't step in and make the sale. He steps in to assist them make the sale and that may mean them getting more directly involved than they normally would, but they've got to be prepared to step back and let that person make some mistakes so they can learn along the way. The rule is let the, uh, the salesperson fail, don't let the business fail. Exactly. And create a culture where you don't punish failure, you punish hiding it. Yeah. That's really yeah. important because too often we're encouraged through our compensation, through the management culture, through the way we're compensated uh, into unintended consequences for the business and for the customer and for the individual. So you end up creating needless friction. 
you, cre- you create the conditions for turnover within the sales team. You create burnout. You create the conditions for customer churn. That adds a tariff downstream for new yeah. business because now you have to replace customers that you could have kept and made a lot of profit from over their lifetime. But, I mean, the insanity of the way uh, business is set up at the moment. So tell me this, what was the impact on the results, the intended outcome for the business of having managers like that in terms of the performance of the sales team and the renewal rates and adoption rates of the customers? We had, in the, in the team that we were in, we always had a couple of guys that wouldn't make target, but we always had the highest percentage of people make target and we had the highest overachievement of target among those people within the entire organisation. And it was purely came down to, I put it down just to the to personality and the approach that this person took. He didn't try and take over. He actually mentored and coached you through that process. And look, everyone was looking to work for him in the organisation because he, was, he had a great reputation for that. Who, who carried the growth target in that organisation? Each individual. Okay. So um, how did the leader encourage growth rather than just new revenue acquisition? We were actually incentivized or incented on a revenue growth. Now, if you lost revenue out of your customer base, it was up to you to go out there and, and refill that. So when we, when we sat down and we did our budgeting at the start of the year, we looked at where we thought churn would be. We looked at what we needed to do to retain the business. We budgeted for a certain amount that we knew was going to happen or we expected would happen. And then we built our new business around that to fill the void as well as add to the top line. Now, what's really exciting is there are some technologies in the stacks that I'm building that have the ability to give you that insight as a manager or a leader, without having to rely on the fiction that is the forecast. Yeah. Um, because I think forecasting is just m- mythical. It is. It's a horrific experience for everyone involved. I, I mentioned the guy that was the regional, man- regional managing director for the company I was with. I had uh, Hong Kong and Southeast Asia. There was a guy that had Greater China. There was another guy who had Japan, guy that had Australia and New Zealand. I think the hardest we worked was in our budgeting at the, the, you know, a couple of months, up to a quarter before we actually had to submit our budgets because we would all work together to actually see that the team achieved the budget rather than just each individual. And we would move figures around, we'd move opportunities around so that each got there. But as you said, the individual could fail, but not the business. So therefore, that was what we were looking at. And that was the hardest we worked in putting those budgets together. We didn't have the technology that you're talking about back then. If we did, it would have been probably easier. But in calculating that and going back to our long-term clients that we could sit down with them and, and share account plans with, look at where we saw the opportunities, did they agree, where did they see they were going to minimise? Because in those days, we were talking a lot of a lot of telco services that were reducing in cost each year. So where were we going to find those value-added services that we're going to replace that and be there longer term. So if you've got the relationships, and this is another thing we're talking about blind spots, so many people say relationship selling is dead. And I I don't believe that at all. You still need really strong relationships. And we prove that by going out, talking to our individual customers and sharing with them the account plans we had and seeing where they thought we might be missing something or where they saw opportunities. That was built on the trust that we'd build up with those clients. And again, it's really important that people start to uh, realise that engagement is the single biggest defining factor as to whether or not the deals are going over the line. There's a wonderful pair of reports that have come out from EBSTA, E-B-S-T-A, and it's the B2B Sales Benchmark Report 2021, and the 22 one is coming out soon. And uh, they have insight into a billion dollars worth of pipeline. And it's just the most insightful report, uh, looking at the impact it has on sales cycle length, conversion rates, lifetime customer value, the average deal size. And if you 
stop relying on the rubbish that's in your CRM because if you look at the CRM, it should make you weep because it will be full of stuff like left voicemail, call back in three weeks, no response, sent email, chased again, none of which is of any use. 88% of the information contained in CRM on average is utterly useless. And this is meant to be the single source of truth that businesses are basing their investment decisions on, their hiring decisions on. So you need to know what's really going on in terms of engagement. And what's really key is, are you maintaining engagement with the poor buggers who have to use your products and the financial buyer? Because if you're going to do a drive-by uh, shooting every three years to come and pick up a renewal check, you're going to be very disappointed. You are. But again, this comes down to, in making those sales, you've got to engage at different levels within the organisation. And that's one of the things that we speak about in, in the Wentworth Prospect when we wrote that. We, we looked at that as the Wentworth Bank basically thought they needed a, a new security system because they'd been hacked. But when Sue went in there and did her research around the organisation, she learnt that one of the biggest problems that the bank had was that the firewall system that they were using at the time was prohibiting their customer service people really understand how they were engaging with customers. So by implementing the system that they had, which was cloud-based, they could get much greater visibility of what was happening with customers, the dropouts, where they were. Where there was a whole heap of things they weren't seeing just on a firewall base because all they were interested in is keeping the black hats out. Yeah. So in making that sale, she engaged with the finance people, she engaged with customer support, she engaged with marketing, and she understood what each of those or those areas of the business were struggling with and where what she was developing as far as a, an offering was concerned, a value proposition, could address that. So you're absolutely right. The finance guys have got to be involved, but so have a lot of other areas of an organisation, the bigger that you get and the, the bigger the organisation and the bigger the deal you're working with. And it's really important to understand that there are different role functions within the buying com uh, community. So you have authority or power, you have decision makers, but you also have sub decision makers because they may be responsible for different elements of it. You then have influencers, recommenders, specifiers, technical buyers, user buyers, financial buyers, and mobilizers are the ones that are so often forgotten. Everyone yep. talks about champions, but very often you need to find the, the axle greaser to get stuff done. And often that person is hidden. Years ago, I worked for a company and unless Dr. Jim White was involved in the decision, not even a paperclip would be bought. But he yeah. appeared on no organizational chart. No one even knew he existed. But the CEO, Sean, would bring him in for every important decision. Yeah. And if it didn't pass the gym test, nothing went forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately working with a, a startup organization at the moment. Well, not so much a startup, but they're, they've been around for a little while, but they're just going through that, that change period where they're, they've got to start to delegate more and they've got to start to put more processes in place. And the owner of the business just won't step back. He wants to be involved in every little decision that's made. The VP of everything. Oh, absolutely. And it's a problem. It's interesting you talk about you know, champions and that. I spoke about the importance of understanding the individuals and what we've done in the Wentworth Prospect. We've actually broken it up, broken people up into six different archetypes. And we've broken those archetypes into two sections. We've got the change agents and we've got the advocates. And what we look at is we look at mapping those people against relationship and influence. And you identify, you know, we talk about, and in fact, we actually put together a set of cards that, uh, that talk about each of them. And in the change agents, they're the people who've got the power and the personality to make something happen. And we talk about the inquisitor. And the inquisitor is the person that is really looking at interrogating every proposal that comes through. We talk about the sage, and they're the ones that are going to be communicating the ideas. And then we talk about the champion. And that's the person that you really need to be able to get to and get on side. And, and they're the ones that are interested in getting the job done. In the advocates, we talk about the mercenary. And uh, I think we've all seen the mercenary. They're more interested in what's in it for them than they are for what's in it for the business. And we talk about the accomplice. And they're the ones that 
they've got you on side, but they don't have the power to be able to make decisions internally, but they've got the personality and they've got the contacts to introduce you to the right people. And we talk about the messenger. And the messenger's the person that likes the gossip, that like, you know, stands around the, the old US saying, you know, stands around the water cooler and shoots the information. And that's the person that can provide you with information or can put information back into the right people for you. So we work, we spend a lot of time in the book talking about how you get to those people, how you identify them, how you map them, and how you need to build them up. Those that are high influence, you need to build them up into high relationship. And uh, yeah, that's very important. You use the term champion, and we have to have one of those to win major deals. And again, this is really interesting because it, I would have killed to have this kind of tech um, back in the day. But now my salespeople are able to identify the path of least resistance within an enterprise account before they've lifted a finger to type yep. an email or pick up the phone. And we can do that not only within the account, but within their ecosystem. So yep. it could be via suppliers, customers, alumni, and th that sort of stuff was never available before. Now it is. And it, it seems that there are so many people that are fixated on brute force rather than intelligent use of technology. So let's address that issue because I know it pisses you off and yeah. it really inflames me. Yeah, and the one thing you've, that you've got to think about with that, and you and I spoke about it earlier, and that's identifying the, the hidden decision makers in there because, you know, we can do a lot of research, but we will find what's, what's overt. We won't necessarily find what's covert. So you've got to understand and find those hidden decision makers as you work within the organisation. And I spoke to you earlier about, you know, my involvement in, in Asia. And one of, the, one of the biggest issues you've got up there is in, uh, you know, in Chinese culture, largely, the quietest person is the one that's got the most power. And you really need to be careful of how you work in that. And I had a, a situation where... One of my one of my directors from the US came in and he thought he could uh, he could show myself and my sales managers how to crack a deal, and he went in and uh, he walked out and he said to me, "See, that's how it's done." And by the time we got back to the office, we had a phone message left with my sec with my PA saying that the deal was off, mm. and uh, he just had no idea. Again, two other. Fabulous examples of leadership idiocy. My pal, Zach Seltz, working in India, tried to brief his uh, US VP of sales and on culture and whatever. Anyway, uh, said, no, I think I know what I'm doing and turned up and then gave away $30 million over the next 10 years. Then another one, uh, one of my clients, out of 10,000 deals they closed last year, the only deal that they discounted on was the one where the sales manager insisted on coming in to show them how to do it. Yeah, and and you know, and we even talk about that in the book, and we give a great example of the the sales manager walking in with Sue and saying, "This is how it's done." Puts the brochure down, talks about the brochure, and says, "Now I can give you a twenty percent discount if you close today." You know, there's, there's that's not leadership, and that's not good selling. Jason Jordan's book on sales idiocy is brilliant. Definitely I've read that one. Read. And Mark Boundy is uh, writing a series uh, by Mediocrities, the ancient Greek philosopher. Yeah. Um, so I'm writing a chapter for that at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a uh, I've got a Mediocrities T-shirt actually. <laughs> um, I, 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 I've We've got a T-shirt, that, uh, or I've ordered a T-shirt that says something along the lines of dystopia. I'd just like to, uh, I'd like to get back to some fiction, <laughs> given the nature of the way things are at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. tell me this, because it, it, I'd love to explore how your boss managed collaboration across the revenue operation with marketing, with CS operations, account growth. Because and one of the things that I feel is sadly lacking because of the business model that has created this terminal culture where there is this division of labor. And so, you know, I think nowadays salespeople have to be marketers. 
marketers have to be salespeople. And we need to create as much collaboration and reduce as much friction in the buyer's journey as possible. But the way things are set up currently, it creates friction at every possible turn and it makes the customer a forgotten afterthought, which is destabilizing for the salespeople. When did that happen, Marcus? I mean, you, you About go. Four years ago, when Milton Friedman said that we all should be worshiping at the altar of shareholder value. And then people yeah, didn't but, read the end of Adam Smith's book, Wealth of Nations, that said it dehumanizes people. Yeah. We started out with sales and marketing. You go back and, and you look at it. I held the roles myself as sales and marketing manager. And yeah. they were they were under the one control. And then they split. And they got further and further apart. And a lot of that came down to the implementation of technology when things like email and broadcast and, uh, you know, the internet and everything came out there and people started using that as their marketing tools rather than the the broadcast tools that we had previously. It then became much more personalised in the way of individual, individualised rather than personalised, I'd say. And uh, and that created a lot of problems. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And, you know, and I think at the moment, one of the problems is that and I don't like necessarily the term KPIs, but the measurements are very different. Marketing are looking at marketing qualified leads. And when they're passed on, and you and I spoke about it right at the start, it uh, might have even been before we started the, the uh, recording, we spoke about the need to have well-qualified opportunities, not just fill the pipeline continually with marketing qualified leads or suspects, but we need opportunities that are in there that are well qualified and are going to need the most attention to get the most return. If you just continue to fill it with, with, I won't say rubbish, but not well qualified opportunities, not opportunities that are necessarily your ICP, just ones that may have responded to uh, some sort of lead gen or lead magnet that might have been put out there, sales are going to waste their time on that and they're not going to do it. And that creates friction. And that basically comes down to them not working towards common purpose. Because the the emphasis is in the wrong place. The emphasis is on trying to drive top-line revenue growth, new logo acquisition, and build a fictional pipeline in order to drive valuation. And what that does is it takes everyone's eye off the customer. And selling should be the most noble thing we do in our business. Because selling in its rawest form is helping a customer reach the best decision for them, whether it involves us or not. And that's a noble act. That's an act of service. And it's one that engenders and builds trust and builds credibility. But it also requires a bit of savvy because you need to avoid being taken advantage of. So you need to establish clear boundaries and you have to uh, understand that you have rights. But... That stuff seems to have gone by the wayside in favor of having, um, you know, b- b- putting in another pile of scripts and another sequence of emails. Yeah, I had a great example of that many years ago. I took over a divi- I set up a division of a company in uh, Queensland, a state north of New- northern Australia, and um, I won the business of the largest insurance company in Queensland. Became the largest insurance company in Australia. And I got to a point where the relationship with the general manager, I'd actually walked away from a couple of opportunities. And he then asked me, why are you doing that? And I said, well, because I can't match the sort of opportunity or the sort of outcome that's being put forward for you. That is a better solution than what I'm able to put forward. He got to the point then, whenever a competitor walked in, as soon as they leave, he would pick the phone up and call me and said, so-and-so's just been in, they're offering this, what do you think? And I built that level of trust with him that I I was his, I hate the term trusted advisor, but that's what we got. I basically became his consultant and we had that trust. You think of yourself as a partner. Yeah. And that's really important because what we've forgotten is that we need to be collaborating with our customers because they are our best teachers. They inform us of the kind of products that we need to develop. And in fact, our unhappy customers will inform us more uh, honestly than uh, even our happy ones. Yeah, so Bill, Gates, face Bill, Gates, Bill Gates said that uh, you learn, yeah, you learn the most from your dissatisfied customers. 
Um, he must have learned a lot. But uh... <laughs> and well, uh, the Salesforce did a study at the beginning of 2020, um, and it said that you get a 600% faster product development cycle if you speak to your uh, unhappy customers. Speak to them. Yeah. Go and take yeah. a beating for the sake of improving your product and then going back and selling it to the people who are pissed off. There's another question about leadership and about management. How many organisations actually go back and talk to opportunities that have been lost and understand why they lost them and what they could have done better? My friend Kerr McLaughlin down here, he, he does a lot of work in that area, and he wrote, actually wrote something up on LinkedIn today where he was saying it's it, so much of it comes down to the one percenters that if they'd just done, you know, focused on some of the finer details of what they were doing with a client, they would have won the business. But people don't know that because they don't go back and go, you know, they've lost that deal, put it in the out tray, where's the next one? Let's move on. There's a wonderful tactic as well, which is a really powerful way of building credibility, which is you go back to them and say, Wayne, did you manage to solve your problem with X yet? Yeah. And if they come back and say, yes, great. Who did you go with? Congratulations, good company. If they say no, I know that you didn't feel that we were right, but may I introduce you to my closest competitor? I think what we were lacking, they have, and I think uh, they'd be a really good fit. Yeah, but how many sales managers and how many financial controllers and how many CEOs are going to look at it that way and not say, why didn't you close the deal? Because they're looking at that short-term revenue. They don't understand the sales side of things. There's some really interesting research that came out of Gartner recently, which is that about 43% of people who have bought on a marketplace without involving a salesperson end up churning. Yeah. All you're doing is you're buying a problem down the line. And this is where I think a lot of sales leadership needs to open their eyes because the problem with sales is not a problem and it's not a series of point problems. It's a connection of complex, interdependent, interrelated causes that create this tsunami of downstream symptoms, which is why you end up with high turnover, you end up with churn on the customer base, you end up with a discounting habit, you end up with people pillaging pipeline at the end of the quarter to uh, make up this quarter's number, which creates an, a knock-on tariff because you have to replace all those dials and emails and spams and digital adverts. It's expensive. And you yeah. need to look upstream and think bigger. Yeah, and look, my I, I didn't have that that research figure of 43%, but the anecdotal evidence that I've got from, uh, you know, 15 years of consulting now and, uh, you know, a lot of years before that in sales and sales management told me that that was, the, that was happening. When I say earlier, it was where people would make a decision based on just basic advertising or something of that nature and they'd come in and they, they would make a decision on that. It's got worse as people are now, or buyers are now feeling much more empowered that they're able to make decisions without the salesperson because of the amount of information that's out there for them. And that's a challenge for salespeople is how do they get in front of those people and work with them to help them make, as you said, the best decision to give them the best outcome for their business without just saying, oh no, I've got all that information, I don't need you involved. This is where we have to get away from being transactional sellers if Absolutely. we're operating in this B2B complex enterprise space. Because, first of all, on average, you're talking anywhere between 8 to 12 key influencers will uh, impact whether or not a deal gets over the line. And any one of them can veto, probably, or block it. The level of complexity in your space has probably meant that your customers are suffering from information overload. They will have done a lot of research over time because their problem started months or years before they even realized and uh, before they even knew you existed. And as a result of that, most vendor organizations and most leadership fixates on this quarter. My obsession is through two to six quarters out. I want my people prospecting that far out. Yes, at the moment, we've got to you know, look after uh, getting cash in through the door and whatever. 
But I want that focus on the medium to long-term pipeline so they can get the coverage. They can understand where the buyer is in their journey, what the jobs they're trying to get done are, where their struggling moments are, so they can turn up and be relevant and timely. It's interesting. I used to say to my sales guys, look, I, I want you to be looking and working towards that waterfront holiday home that you want, but you've got to feed your kids and family along the way. So, you know, yes, work on those opportunities out there, but you've got to be making the deals along the way to be able to feed the beast. And, uh, you know, you've got to be prospecting that far out. So that I always encourage my salespeople and the clients that I work with to have a really good mix of short and long-term opportunity and, of course, that mix of clients. I, I worked with one organisation. When I went in there, 73% of their revenue was coming from one client. And when I was in recruitment, 76% from Intel. In one week, we went from 146 vacancies exclusively to us to seven for all of their recruiters across all of Europe. And that was it. And we were screwed. Luckily, yeah. I saw it coming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that this organization wouldn't take the advice. And unfortunately, they went under about 12 months later because the organization that was giving them all the money, they had a restructure. And that was it. They didn't need their services the way they were in previously. So that that's critical. But, you know, it, it's that's got to come from the top as well, that people, that the sales manager needs to get the support or the sales leader needs yeah. to get the support from his peers within the organisation and he must help them understand that. So one of the one of the roles of good sales leadership and good sales management is that up and down communication. They need to filter information down to the salespeople and give it to them in a way that's not going to demotivate them. And they need to be able to influence the people above them to understand what sales is all about and why it's not just a short-term gain, but make the, make the current numbers, but also be planning future out. And if you're going to miss a couple of quarters, have a good reason for it and, and be able to back that up with a sound strategy for why. But it takes a brave leader to tell your investors Absolutely. you're going to have a couple of bad quarters. So again, this speaks to how important it is to make sure that if you are getting in bed with the devil, that you're getting in bed with the right type of money. So there is good money, there is bad money, and there is dumb money. And bad yeah. money is often dressed up as good money. So you're often yeah. better off with dumb money. With that, all they're giving you is the cash. And then you've got to worry about whether or not they're going to start trying to influence your focus. Because the minute the money comes in from outside, and I have a real issue with uh, young founders thinking that raising lots and lots of money in funding is a victory. Actually, for many of them, it's their death warrant. Yeah, and a lot of that then comes down to, you know, not necessarily with startups that are raising money like that, but you look at other organisations that are, you know, CEOs in the C-suite are being rewarded for short-term performance, yeah, and that to me is where one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges is: is how do you change that mindset? Because they're being rewarded for short-term performance because the shareholders, and a lot of it would be the public shareholders, are looking for you know that gain, that that capital gain in the investment that they've made in an organisation. Well, again, th this speaks to the blindness. One of my favorite Mark Twain quotes is, your eyes won't see when your imagination is out of focus. Yeah. And the way the markets are set up, they're fueling uh, the behavior that drives scale and rampant growth without necessarily creating the sustainable uh, business behind it and building the uh, solid relationships with customers so that you've got that steady stream. So you've got a regular cash flow, you, you can depend on 80% of your revenue, and then you know, you're, you're encouraged to innovate with those customers. But far, far too few organizations think like that because they're worried about next quarter's uh, or this quarter's number. And they may be looking a year out, possibly. They'll have a strategy, but none of them are actually paying any attention to working towards it together. And yeah. you only have to look at the 40% burnout rate of senior hires. You know, they fail within a year, 40%. So that's 40% of the CEO's vision that's off track or behind. 
But unfortunately, Marcus, all leadership is being is in that sort of situation now. We talk about our, our politicians, they're in the same thing. They're they're managing from one election cycle to the next. And there's no long-term thinking there that's well, being implemented. This is why I think there is an enormous, enormous opportunity for people like us, because that system is predicated on being publicly listed or having investment. Chris Anderson wrote a book about 15 years ago called The Long Tail, and his prediction was that the long tail would outperform the major corporations because in Amazon's case, you know, they sell more one copies of one copy of a book than they do bestsellers. And they make that's where they make their money when they're selling books. It's all the other stuff as well. So if we refer to the, the long tail, if we think of the long tail, that's a lot of A players clubbing together and working towards common purpose. And I think it might be possible because of the demographic shift because 30% of the employees coming into the workforce this year are Gen Z. 60% of managers are already millennial. Um, so yeah. they have a very different set of values, and uh, they're looking for purpose. To attract the top talent, if you don't uh, have that message and you don't live that culture, then you're going to struggle. And I think a lot of those large companies will have their market share ripped from under them. Yeah, because the, the, those coming in are looking, as you say, for purpose and culture much more than they're looking at for you know the the next dollar that they're going to make. Uh, absolutely, but then working collaboratively together, so finding yeah. adjacent providers. So even when you don't have something to sell, you can bring value by being a source of innovation. That's yeah. really powerful. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. The area that I live in, I'm in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney. And uh, we've got a lot of tree changes up here. And we've got a lot of artistic people, creative people. And I was a director of the economic enterprise for the, for the region for a number of years. And we had a great deal of success by pulling together clusters of like-minded people. We had a cluster of beverage makers because up here we had winemakers, gin makers, cider makers, we had craft breweries. And we pulled them together and they started working together, most of them young people. And uh, they started working together and the level of success they got was great. What they needed was for someone a bit older and a bit more experienced to be able to show them the way and for them then to get together and build the trust with each other to be able to do it. We did exactly the same with filmmaking. And we've had you know, some of the, the actual blockbuster films that have been out there have been all the creative work, all of the uh, computer graphics and that have been done up here in the Blue Mountains because we pulled these areas together and it's had an enormous effect on the region from an economic perspective. So, you know, we're not as reliant now on tourism, which we were previously. We've now got growth areas in, uh, you know, in, in the arts. We've got growth areas in filmmaking. We've got growth areas in beverage. So, you know, it's been, it's That's been great. Wonderful, wonderful to hear. Because yeah. I, I think that the future, our, our success in the future will be determined by our ability to collaborate. Yeah. And I'm seeing it more and more with the, the ecosystems that I'm uh, working within and helping to build. It's really interesting. So we, we can resolve any problem at the top, middle or bottom of the funnel. And I've got A players, all of whom I know I can depend on to deliver. And I, I see my role as being a conduit. Um, you know, it, it's uh, being a, a talent uh, pipeline for my, uh, my clients. And building that ecosystem, building that marketplace, we create an internal referral marketplace. And you know, we know that the conversion rate is 14 to 18 times higher when you get a warm introduction by someone who is trusted by both parties. The average order value, the initial order value is higher. The lifetime value of that customer is higher. The retention rate is higher. The employee engagement rates are higher. And again, when you're thinking about trying to build value for shareholders, if you have highly engaged employees with enabled managers who are coaching instead of being directive, then they're not being a bottleneck. They're actually releasing the creative capability of every employee. Now, yeah. that's the kind of company that I would want to work for and I would be terrified to compete against. Yeah, and, and look, you know, I think it was Richard Branson that said, you know, I surround myself with people smarter than myself and get out of the way and let them do their job. And... You know, I, I think that's one of the things that, that we need to do. I know in my roles in general management and, and 
managing director, one of the things that I really, I worked really hard to do was to get great operations manager, a great financial controller, and a great CIO. The sales side of things, I could coach the sales managers that I had, but I, if I needed to churn those other three positions to get the right people in place, I had to do that. And I then just relied on them to give me the information that I needed to run that business. And if you had the right people in place, they could get out there, do what was needed. You bring them in and trust them as part of that, that, that planning process that you've put in place and then let them do their job. And that was one of the things that the guy that I was talking about, as long as I, as long as I hit my top and bottom line and what I did was legal, moral and ethical, he got out of my way. When I started I missing numbers, right. you know, he'd be on the phone and you know, well, I spoke to him you know, regularly anyhow, but it would be, okay, what do we need to do together to make this happen? What, where have we got this wrong? It was never, where have you got it wrong? Where have we got this wrong? Because we worked on it together as a team. And, um, and that was great. You know, it, it never saw, you never felt under threat. So this then raises another really interesting question because I, I have a dilemma because I, I do like my luxuries, don't get me wrong. And I, you know, I, I like to have money to spend. But experience tells me that the way commission plans are designed creates an awful lot of friction and resentment. And it doesn't actually drive the right kind of behavior. So my thinking is that commission should be revamped and we should be compensating the team for milestones that the customer accomplishes. So when adoption and consumption rates uh, hit a certain level, heaven forbid the customer actually achieves the outcome that they want, they intended from the investment. That's a big payout. On the third renewal, there is a huge payout because that tells me that you've done your job and you've looked after them. And then you know the third and sixth and the ninth renewal, they buy you a house, whatever it happens to be. But I think compensation needs to be focused not on the short-term front-end top of the funnel. And we've got to stop uh, using the CRM to refocus people from top to bottom of the funnel and ignore the middle. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. I took over an organisation that had a, that salespeople were paid a, an ongoing percentage of revenue on everything they sold. And these were organisations that had high recurring revenues. That meant that the guys that were in early got extremely good salary packages. The guys that came in later struggled because a lot of the top fruit was uh, was well, sorry, bottom fruit was already picked. But you know they they got the best peaches and off they were and they were doing it. So I tried to to make change. And you know you asked me earlier if I've ever been blindsided. Well, this one caught me right out of left field, and I started to implement this change. But I didn't know that these guys that had been there longer were very well connected with some of the uh, the people that I reported to. And they undermined me. They blindsided me by going above my head to say that if that was implemented, they were leaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, that caught me right out. And I, I couldn't implement it. It had to be done, but I couldn't do it. It was done later because these people eventually did leave and that gave the, you know, the person that replaced me the opportunity to do something like that. I just couldn't do it. I just didn't have the leverage to be able to make that happen. I agree with you. There's a, a guy down here in Australia that um, that I know quite well, Graham Hawkins, and he's argued for a long time that you know, we should do away with commissions. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think we need to restructure it so that there's more team payment as well as uh, a reward to the salesperson that's putting a lot on the line. I'd love to talk to Graham. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can introduce you. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Wayne, we've come to time. So uh, this yeah. is whiz by. Thank you. Tell me this. You've got a golden ticket and you can go back and whisper in the ear of the idiot Wayne, age 23. What one choice bit of advice would you have given him? Presumably that would have been your first sales job, uh, sales management job. Well, my first sales manager role, I, I guess there'd be two things. The first thing would have been don't take the sales manager's role. Um, <laughs> <laughs> until I knew a lot more about what sales management It's not was. fair on the people you'll be managing. Yeah. But I've, I've had, in fact, I've been going through a similar discussion with my son at the moment who's just, uh, he's studying environmental management and he's uh, working for an air conditioning company in a uh, service management role with them as he's going through. And we only sat down the other night and, and, I, and he's 
24, so not far off. And I said, when I was your age, I didn't have a career plan. And I look back now and I regret that. I looked at job to job rather than sitting there and having a plan of really where I wanted to go in my career. And that made me make a couple of bad decisions in my career. And if you have a look through my my resume, there's a few, I won't say holes, they're, they're there, but they're definitely not the right decisions that I made at the time because I didn't have that that plan of where I wanted to be and when I wanted to be there. So it's that would very good advice. That would be the um, advice. In fact, when I recruit, one of the first things that I do is I ask a candidate what their next job will be yep. um, because uh, from day one, I want to be grooming them into that role. I want yep. them to have a 12 to 24-month runway yeah, into it. Ideally, I'd like them to stay in the sales role for at least three and a half, four years, because yeah. that's when they really hit their stride. But after that, what comes next? I want them prepared. I yeah. don't want them walking into it and then ruining the lives of five to seven other salespeople. Yeah, exactly. Um, and all, losing all those customers. The cost of a wrong enterprise hire is 35 to 125 times salary. Incre- you can multiply that by the number of salespeople for a wrong hire in sales management in enterprise. Yeah, that to me, if I have my time again, and look, you know, my father passed away by by the time I was starting to, to, to build a career, so I didn't really have a mentor there that could, that could guide me. And uh, yeah, that'd be the thing, is it'd be have that career plan, know where you want to be and, and what you've got to do to get there. And I would add to that, ask people to mentor you. There's a yeah. wonderful tactic that I've taught people to do, and it's you write an in-mail to them, Wayne, cheeky ask, um, I'm looking for a mentor. Your history looks like my future. Would you be willing to spend 20 minutes a month with me? I will yep. always bring you a problem that I can't solve myself and the three things I've tried to fix it and why they yep. didn't work. And then I'll take your guidance. And anytime I show up unprepared, you can fire me. And people are getting lots and lots of mentors. You know, I've got people get a dozen mentors that way. Marcus, I've still got a mentor. I'm 68 and I've got a mentor who's 61, extremely successful guy. He was a self-made multimillionaire at 40. And um, I, I ride motorbikes with him. So, you know, we've got a passion uh, that we share. But he's a very, very successful businessman and a guy that I, I lean on very regularly. And, um, you know, I, I'd encourage anyone, as you said, to have a mentor as well. Absolutely. I've got six coaches on the go, all for different things. Yeah. And they're invaluable. Excellent. Yeah. Wayne, what would you recommend people read apart from obviously the Wentworth Prospect? Look, I, I it was interesting you, you asked that. I've got, I'm going to reach over the back here. There's one that I, I mentioned earlier. And in fact, there's two. And the first one is a book called Sense Making. And you can't really see it if it's upheld up there, but Sense Making. And it's written by, I think he's Norwegian. Christian Madsberg, and it's M-A-D-S-B-J-E-R-G. And um, it talks about what I've been talking about, that sense-making and the importance of really being able to make sense of things. And he also talks about the qualities of great leaders, and um, I think that's very important. The other one is a story by a, a book by a guy down here called Mike Adams, yeah. And it's the seven stories that every salesperson must tell. And there's a couple of backup books for that. But uh, uh, one called A Thousand Brains, and uh, that is uh, A Thousand Brains by Jeff Hawkins. And that talks about the theory of intelligence, which I think is extremely important to salespeople and business leaders as to oh, understand. Definitely. So they're the three books that I would recommend anyone pick up and read, apart from, of course, as I said, the Wentworth Prospect. Excellent. And you've written other books, haven't you? So what I have a couple of books, but they're more handbooks. The first one I wrote was on sales management. And I wrote that it's a, a, your roadmap to sales management success. And it's a handbook written because of my failure as a sales manager. And it covers, it doesn't break any new ground. It's the basics. Anyone going into sales management, it covers those basics and your roadmap to achieving B2B sales success again, is exactly the same because I believe that so much of the foundation in sales is overlooked in people's training and development. Again, that's a handbook. It doesn't break new ground. It covers all of the basics that I think salespeople need to understand. 
So, yeah, they're the, they're the two that I've got out there that are handbooks. You can pick them up, join in wherever you want and pick out the pieces that you need. But then the Wentworth Prospect covers complex sales. Excellent. Wayne, how can people get hold of you? Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, send me a, a, a message on LinkedIn. That's Wayne Maloney, M-O-L-O-N-E-Y. Or they can get me at wayne at waynemaloney.com and my website is waynemaloney.com. Excellent. Wayne Maloney, thank you. My pleasure, Marcus. It's been, a, it's been an enormous amount of fun. Excellent. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you've enjoyed this, then please like, comment, share, and tag someone. Tell them about the interview and maybe uh, give them some reasons to uh, subscribe to the Inquisitor podcast. If you think you'd be a good guest, then please do drop me a line. If you know someone or you think you'd like me to interview someone, then please drop me their details or connect us on LinkedIn as well. And if you want to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.